<clears throat> so once upon a time, there was a place called Lesterland. Uh, you didn't hear this in the introduction because it's a secret, so you can't tell anybody. My name is actually Lester, Lawrence Lessig. Um, so I'm allowed to make fun of Lester, so I want to make fun of Lester by introducing you to this place called Lesterland. Lesterland is a lot like the United States. It has about 310 million people. Of the 310 million people, about 144,000 are named Lester. So that means about 0.05% of Lesterland is named Lester. Now, the thing about Lester's in Lesterland is they have an extraordinary kind of power. There are two elections every election cycle in Lesterland. There's a general election, and there's a Lester election. In the Lester election, the Lesters get to vote. In the general election, all citizens over the 18, over age 18, in some states, if you have an ID, get to vote. <laughs> but here's the trick. To be allowed to run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the Leicester election. You don't necessarily have to win, but you must do extremely well. Now, what can we say about this democracy in Leicesterland? Well, we could say, as the Supreme Court said about the United States and Citizens United, the people have the ultimate influence over elected officials because, of course, there is a general election. But only after the Lesters have had their way with the candidates who want to win in the general election. Point number two, obviously, this dependence upon the Lesters is going to produce a subtle and understated and camouflaged bending to keep the Lesters happy. And number three, reform that angers the Lesters is, we could say, unlikely. OK, that's Lesterland. There are four things I want you to recognize now that I've described Lesterland. Number one, the United States is Lesterland. The United States is Lesterland. The United States looks like this, too. The United States also has two elections. One election is called the general election. The other election is called the money election. In the general election, the citizens get to vote if you're over 18, in some states if you have an ID. In the money election, it's the relevant funders who get to vote, the funders. And just as in Lesterland, to run in the general election, you must do extremely well in the money election. You don't necessarily have to win, but you must do extremely well. And here's the key. There are just as few relevant funders in the United States as there are Lesters in Lesterland. Now you say, really? Really? 0.05%? Well, here are the numbers from this election. 0.3% of Americans, one third of 1% of Americans, gave more than $200 in any congressional election this cycle. 0.055% gave the maximum amount to any congressional candidate. 0.01% the 1% of the 1% gave $10,000 or more in this election cycle. 0.0003% gave $100,000 or more in this election cycle. And this is my favorite number, 0.00042%. For those of you doing the numbers, you know that's 132 Americans <laughs> have given 60% of the super PAC money spent in this election cycle so far. So, you know, I'm a lawyer. I look between 0.3 and 0.055 and 0.01. I think it's fair for me to approximate the relevant funders at 0.05%. I think it's fair for me to say these funders are our Lesters. Now, as we can say about Lester land, this is what we can say about USA land. Number one, as the Supreme Court said in Citizens United, the people have the ultimate influence over elected officials. Sure they do but only after the funders have had their way with the candidates who want to run in that general election. Number two, obviously, this dependence upon the funders produces a subtle and understated and camouflaged bending to keep the funders happy. 30 to 70% of a congressperson's time is spent raising money to get back to Congress or to get his or her party back in power. 30 to 70 percent. 
And as they do that, they develop, as any of us would, a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters. As they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not on issues 1 to 10, but on issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then she went on to clarify, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> and that leads to point three, reform that angers the funders is in this democracy, we could say, highly unlikely. OK, so that's the first point. The United States is Lesterland. Here's the second point. The United States is worse than Lesterland, worse than Lesterland. Because you can imagine in Leicesterland, if we Leicesters got a letter from the government and said, you guys have been chosen to select the candidates who get to run in the general election, because we come from all parts of society, there are rich Leicesters and poor Leicesters, there are black Leicesters, there are white Leicesters, there are no women Leicesters, that's a problem here to this theory, but okay, put that aside. <laughs> because we come from all parts of society, it's at least conceivable we would develop a kind of aristocratic attitude. We need to act for the good of Leicesterland. It's at least, we could say, possible that the Leicesters in Leicesterland would think about the good of Leicesterland. That's why they're there. They're the Leicesters of Leicesterland. But in our land, in this land, in USA land, the Leicesters act for the Leicesters. The shifting coalitions of interest that comprise the 0.055% are comprised of people who have an interest on the is of the issues that are just over the horizon. So if it's global warming, you know it's oil companies and coal companies that comprise a significant part of the Lester's. If it's healthcare, you know it's the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance companies and doctors who comprise a significant component of the Lester's. These shifting coalitions pull together in light of what issues are on the horizon and don't demand that government act in the public interest. They demand that government act in their interest. So in this sense, the USA is worse than Lesterland. And point number three, whatever one wants to say about Lesterland, in our land, in our version of Lesterland, in USA land, we need to understand this conflicting dependence as plain and simple corruption. Now, I don't mean old-fashioned corruption of cash being secreted around in brown paper bags against the bribery laws. I don't mean Rob Blagojevich corruption, where people are using personal power to benefit themselves. I don't mean any criminal act at all. Everything I'm talking about is perfectly legal. But instead, I mean corruption relative to the framers' baseline of how this republic was to function. The framers gave us what they called a republic. But by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, they meant, as Federalist 52 describes it, a government that would have a branch that would be, quote, dependent upon the people alone. So here's their model of government. We have the people. We have the government. I do my own slides. It's cool the way that bounces like that. OK. The people and the government. This exclusive dependency, so would the public good be found through that exclusive dependency. But the problem is Congress has evolved a different dependence, no longer a dependence upon the people, but increasingly a dependence upon the funders too. This is a dependence. And it's different and conflicting from a dependence upon the people so long as the funders are not the people. This is corruption. And this corruption has an effect. Its first effect is it leads most Americans to believe, and I think Americans are right to believe, but let's put that aside. They believe, Americans believe, quote, money buys results in Congress. 75% of Americans, according to a poll conducted for the book that I published last fall, a little bit higher Democrats than Republicans, but I guarantee you before the Republicans took control of the House, it was just as many Republicans as Democrats. So whether it's two-thirds or three-fourths, Here's the one thing we all, as Americans, believe. Money buys results in Congress. Leading to point number two, that belief erodes trust in the institutions of government. ABC and New York Times found last year that 9% of 
of Americans had confidence in Congress? 9%. You know, we should put that in some context. It's certainly the case at the time of the American Revolution that a higher percentage of Americans had confidence in the British crown than have confidence in the United States Congress today. And that leads to point three. This erosion erodes participation in the system. Why would you participate if it's the money that's buying results? Rock the Vote, that organize, which organizes young voters and turns them out to vote, and in 2008 turned out the largest number of young voters in the history of voting. We don't know about the numbers yet for 2012 found that in 2010, a significant number of their new voters were just not going to show up. So they pulled them to ask them why. Number one reason by far, two to one over the second highest reason was, quote, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. And it's not just kids. 2010, the vast majority of people who could have voted did not vote, in part at least because of this belief. And in this election, at least 40% of the people who could have voted did not vote, in part at least because of this belief. And then finally, point four. The system is a corruption of our democracy. We have to recognize how it produces instability within this democracy. In a world where 24,000 people comprise the 0.01%, 24,000 people are contributing in a way that matters. Just recognize this means that for any interest that you want to block, it's a tiny fraction of this 24,000. You need to rally to your side. Let's say 2,400 people to your side giving contributions at the maximum amount are enough to enable you to block any reform on any issue you might care about. A tiny, tiny fraction of America have the ability to veto change. How is a government to survive in a world where a tiny, tiny fraction of its population has the effective power to guarantee change can't happen? A tiny fraction of the 1% have the capacity in this government now to stop this government. Now, it should be obvious, but let me just state the obvious. Climate policy is not immune to this dynamic. Obviously so. It, too, is governed by the Lesters. Climate policy, too, is governed by the Lesters. If you look in the presidential election cycle over the past uh, eight years, we've seen radical increase in the amount of money coming into this uh, campaigns from this sector. Even in the off-year elections, we've seen equivalent growth in the money coming in from this sector. And that money is severely tilted against progressive policies. In this cycle, 80% of the money supported Republican candidates. 80% of that money. Now, this just builds their capacity, this money, to block change. And it burdens sensible policy here perpetually. Now, there's some people who look at this election and say, well, you know, this election shows that there is still hope. There is $6 billion spent but as one commentator said, it's totally reasonable to conclude that the money didn't matter. I think that view is just ridiculous, ridiculous. It's totally unreasonable to conclude that the money did not matter, and unreasonable because of a very important incentive that political theorists have been talking about now for almost a decade. This is a paper written by Marcus Shaman and Ethan Kaplan called The Iceberg Theory of Political Campaign Contributions. And what they observe, what they demonstrate, and then through their empirical evidence show, is that the money that is in an election is not just the money that's actually given. It's also the money that's threatened to be given to your opponent. So there's a certain amount of money that's actually given to campaigns, to candidates. And then there's a certain amount of money that is threatened to be given, but is not actually given to your opponent. And $10,000 given to you is the equivalent of $2,000 given to you and $8,000 threatened to your opponent. So when we look at the money that was in this election, we can't just say, hurrah, we won. The other side didn't get their candidates because the people who won are completely aware of the money that's willing to be spent to hold them in check if they act in a way that's against the interests of that money. 
So just think about the, 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 the scale here, right? In the presidential election, there's about $285 million of, I think, completely harmless good money. This is small dollar contributions. More for Obama than Romney, but still significant amount on both sides. Then there's party money, which is, I think, also relatively benign because it's coming behind ideologies the parties are specifying. But the significant money is not this money. The significant money are the large contributions, which though Obama has a larger number of small contributors, he also has a larger number of large contributors. And of course, the outside independent money, which combined to, of course, give Romney more total spending in the presidential campaign, but is still significant with Obama. So $651 million for the president, $746 million for Romney. These are gifts and threats. To your side, they're a gift. On the other side, they're a threat. And the point to recognize is the way those gifts and threat create incentives, the incentives that drive towards the policies that the money is being spent to promote. Same thing in Congress. We have a relatively small amount in Congress of what I think is perfectly clean money and then party money, then a large amount of large contributions, and an equally significant amount of outside spending. So the Democrats got about a half a billion dollars in this interested contributions. Republicans got about uh, three quarters of a billion dollars in this interested contributions. Again, a gift and a threat. This imbalance is always going to mean defeat for your issues. Even where there is a victory, there is a defeat for your issues. OK, finally, what's the solution to this kind of problem? So there's a systemic problem here. This is the problem. The funders are not the people. The funders are not the people. The systemic solution here is to make it so the funders are the people. To make it so we are the funders and they are dependent upon us. To give Congress away, I know that looks like give Congress away. Nobody would take Congress. I don't mean give Congress to someone. I mean give Congress one way to fund their campaigns without Faust, without selling their souls and thereby alienating America. And the only way to do that is, in my view, to embrace openly and loudly what I call citizen-funded campaigns. These are systems where states opt into structures that allow small-dollar-funded campaigns to fund winning campaigns. These are systems where candidates opt into voluntarily taking small contributions only. But then the government system behind it amplifies those contributions so that Candidates can afford to win taking no large contributions at all. So there are many versions of this. There's a matching grant system, which Arizona and Maine and Connecticut have. Connecticut, when it adopted it in its first year, 78% of the elected representatives opted into that system. They took small contributions only, Republicans and Democrats alike, and were successful in their campaign. New York City has the same system as well. Or there's tax credit system, which Oregon has, giving people a tax credit for money contributed in small ways to candidates. Or there's a voucher system, which Bruce Ackerman and I have proposed. I proposed something called the Grant and Franklin Project, where every voter would get a $50 voucher to give to candidates who agree to fund their campaigns with small contributions only. That's Grant. As well as $100, they can take $100 contributions for many citizens. So that's Franklin. So Grant and Franklin would constitute the total funding for these campaigns. Yesterday, there was a proposal announced called the American Anti-Corruption Act, which has $100 vouchers, tax credits for $100 vouchers, that would fund campaigns in a way that would guarantee people were only taking small contributions. Or there's even a version of this that puts all three together. Congressman Sarbanes from Maryland has the Grassroots Democracy Act that has a matching grant proposal, has a tax credit proposal, and has a pilot program for a voucher program. Now, the point is, each of these are systems for funding campaigns from the bottom up. Only citizens are contributing, and all citizens have the capacity to contribute. And each of them, then, is collapsing the difference between the funders and the people. So changing the effective election we have right now, the money election, where the top 1% has 10 times the per capita influence as the bottom 99%, into the same norm that governs the voting election, where all of us equally have a capacity to affect through voting and through contributions. And if we could have this, if we could have a system where small dollar contributions alone 
for funding elections, then we all could believe, as they desperately want to believe, that when Congress did something stupid, it was either because there were too many Democrats or because there were too many Republicans, but not because of the money, because we would have removed the fundamental premise necessary to assume that their behavior is being driven by the money. Now, let me just end with one more bit. A controversial figure, perhaps, in this movement, but I still think of him as something of a hero. Here's Al Gore. I'm a big advocate of changing the light bulbs and buying hybrids and Tipper and I put 33 solar panels on our house and dug the geothermal wells and done all of that uh, other stuff. But uh, as important it is, as it is to change the light bulbs, it's more important to change the laws. And when we change our behavior in our, in our daily lives, we sometimes leave out the citizenship part and the democracy part. In order to be optimistic about this, we have to become incredibly active as citizens in our democracy. In order to solve the climate crisis, we have to solve the democracy crisis. So the democracy crisis. I don't think that's quite the way to describe it. I would describe it as the republic crisis. The Republic crisis. Ben Franklin, when he was carried from the Constitutional Convention in 1787, was stopped on a Philadelphia street and asked, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? Franklin said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it, a republic, a representative democracy, a government with a branch dependent upon the people alone. We've not kept that. We've lost that republic. And what we all have to do is to act, all of us, for any of these issues to get it back. Thank you very much. Thank you.